I'm a thousand feet above an Argentinian desert. Somehow I've got to find an animal this big in this lot. It's an animal that is utterly bizarre and one that virtually nobody has ever heard of. A weird creature that I've been totally fascinated by since seeing it in London's Natural History Museum as a boy. And like all animals, my weird creature faces all sorts of challenges. And it's how this creature has solved the challenge of defence that makes it weird, wonderful and, for me, wanted. The Natural History Museum, London. My second home as a child. It was here that I fell in love with the diverse and bizarre world of animals which we share the planet with. Now, my visits are a starting point to breathe life into the dried bones and pickled skins of some of the planet's weird creatures. Today's weird creature is all about defence and with the help of the Natural History Museum and its Director of Science Richard Lane, we're going to hopefully put some flesh on the bones. Richard is responsible for around 70 million specimens that this place contains and my weird animal is amongst them. A bizarre armour-plated mammal, its predecessors and relatives are here too. Well, Nick, I have something I'd like to show you. It's a predecessor of your curious creature. Ah. It's one of the most heavily armoured animals in our collection, and the fossils of this animal were one of the first things that Charles Darwin, sort of father of evolution, sent back from his travels in South America. Fantastic. And there it is, look. And isn't it amazing? Yeah. Isn't it absolutely incredible? A glyptodont. An ancient armour-plated mammal the size of a small car. And the Natural History Museum's resident fossil expert dealing with this period of prehistory is Andy Current. Hello, Andy. How you doing? How are you? <laughs> I'm all right. Now, tell me something about this thing, because Armour-plated mammals is something you don't really think of. You think about armour-plated invertebrates like insects and crustaceans and all the rest of it, but the mammals, it didn't happen very often, did it? And this is like the most spectacular example, this glyptodon. Battle tanks. They are the yeah. original battle tank. And this thing, you know, it's got a shield on its head, it's got a bony covering all over its body, and even its tail yeah, well, has I mean, covered. That's, that's amazing, that is an incredible structure. How did its armour work? These little pieces of bone called scoots, they grow as individual nodules and then they line up against each other and fuse together. Okay. Have a go, have a go. See, it's a lot bigger. Oh, wow. It's quite light, isn't it's it? I was light. expecting it to be um, like solid rock. Uh, this is one we made earlier. <laughs> uh, this is from a specimen which we believe was bombed somewhere in London during the last war. Ah, so they, they're good against, uh, against your, your sabre-toothed cat, but uh, they, can't, they can't deal with a bomb, is that yeah, right? yeah, 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 they could probably <laughs> withstand a mortar attack, but I think a bomb was uh, probably too much for them. The glyptodonts are extinct. They died out something like 10,000 years ago, but they do have some modern living relatives. And like the glyptodonts, they're found only in the Americas, and they're also armour-plated. Just look at them, the armadillos. They don't get much weirder than that. Like the glyptodonts, they have armour based on bone. But rather than hexagons, it's arranged in flexible bands. And my target weird creature is amongst them. And there it is. The weirdest of them all, the smallest of the armadillos, the pink fairy armadillo. It's a fluffy, pink, fairy, armour-plated, odd mammal, and I've wanted to find one all my life. So what could Richard tell me about it? One of the uh, jobs we do here at the Natural History Museum is to work out what animals do for a living. Unlike 
uh, many other animals in this gallery that we know quite a bit about. This little pink fairy armadillo, we know virtually nothing about. So what you're telling me is pretty much everything we know about this animal is pretty much printed on the, on the plant yeah, behind yeah, it. And not a lot more. We, we know, for example, that it occurs in uh, Western Argentina, in sandy areas. Uh, very few people have ever seen this thing alive. And virtually no one living knows much about them. With a bit of luck, we will go out there and uh, we will see one of these things for real in the flesh. That would be brilliant. That, that's, yeah. that's the aim anyway. I'm sure you're really going to enjoy doing that hunt, <laughs> I tell you. Our search takes us halfway round the globe to the new world of Latin America. Home to all sorts of zoological oddballs, including the armadillo family. miles away from London now. Uh, we're in Argentina in the Mendoza province. We're about halfway down the length of Argentina in the far west. To my right we have the Andes Mountains and to my left we have, well, miles upon miles upon miles of arid grassland. And this is the land of the pink fairy armadillo. I've got a week out here to scour the region and track down the beast. Now these things are not going to be easy to find, so uh, we've given ourselves, well, as much of an edge as possible um, in the form of uh, these wanted posters which have been uh, distributed by our secret weapon, which is uh, Mariella, who has uh, not only is uh, someone who's studying armadillos, but she also shares my passion, which is she also desperately wants to see a PFA, a pink fairy armadillo. Mariella is an armadillo enthusiast doing a PhD on those very animals. Hopefully her posters will get a response from the locals. Darwin travelled through this exact region 172 years ago, and we are following in his footsteps. It's a hotspot for extinct volcanoes, 800 of them. But as Darwin found out, it's also a hotspot for armadillos. Not only are elusive pink fairy armadillo, but the infinitely more common peachy or dwarf armadillo, and of course, the large hairy armadillo. Hopefully, they all like large hairy bait. Not me, that. Blimey, what's happened? It's like apocalypse cow here. I'm hoping for a fresher one. I want to see if anything's scavenging them. Now, as well as pink fairies, large hairy armadillos are something Mariella also knows quite a lot about. Actually, they would be very close to the dead body. Well, closer than this? Closer than this, yeah. Really? Sometimes they even make their burrow just below, underneath it. Underneath it. <laughs> I guess it makes sense. So, are they actually it's like fast food restaurants? Are they actually you know? scavenging on the um, mm, on the flies? Yeah, on the flies or the the, the larvae or, or the, the larvae. actual flesh. It is well possible that they eat both flesh and uh, these insects. This is the wrong side to be standing yes, on this Yes, that's definitely um, wrong side. So okay, go let's, uh, let's scoot around kind of quick. So, what about this one? Oh, look, I guess the armadillo expert has to find an armadillo Of burrow. course. Oh, That's look my at job. That. I would suppose that this animal has left the burrow. You think so? And it hasn't left a lot of time ago because you still see yeah. the little footsteps. I mean, this is still a relatively big animal, so they do live signs. I guess a pink fairy armadillo is going to live such tiny signs, it's going to be right. quite a subtle art to actually pick up any, anything anyway. But, but maybe they don't even have burrows, huh? Exactly. But after hours of searching, no hint of any armadillos, pink fairy ones or large hairy ones. Then Guillermo, one of our guides, finally spots a large hairy armadillo racing into a burrow in the distance. 
So that, that there is one definitely in there. We yeah. just we just seen it, but nothing too <laughs> just too fast. We've seen it disappearing in there. But... We've got everything in our favour. We have Armadillo Expert. We have a good day for it. We have perfect conditions. We have two relatively large armadillos, which are relatively common, and we haven't seen one of them. Except for the one that just disappeared down this hole. What chance have we got of ever finding the pink fairy armadillo? One has to remain positive and buoyant, though. Deserts are places that really come to life after the sun goes down. Oh my goodness, what a strange beast. Okay, we still haven't seen any armadillos, but we've just put these here, these little fluffy little rabbit-like things. Oh, there's one, oh, there's one here, right, 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 look at that. Is that not a weird beast? It's like it's, a, it's like a, I don't know what it looks like. It doesn't look right at all. It's got rabbit-like features. It's got a wicked stripe on its face. Strange little ears and it's got a long tail. And it runs a bit like a rabbit. Come over here, you can just sit here, look. They're Viscatchers, bizarre creatures closely related to chinchillas, but much, much bigger. Like our pink fairy armadillo, they are only found here in this part of South America. That very strange noise, I'm not sure if that's alarm calls or contact. <laughs> Sounds like some, something's trod on their foot. These are the most charismatic little fluffy things I've ever seen. And they allowed us to get quite close, which is a bonus. If you flick your torch off them, they don't get accustomed to the light. Oh, I think I've probably blown it with this one already. Now, while I was trawling through uh, Mr. Darwin's diary, there is a little bit here um, about uh, Viscatcher, which basically says, uh, the Viscatcher has one very singular habit, namely dragging every hard object to the mouth of its burrow. Around each group of holes, many bones of cattle, stones, thistle stalks, hard lumps of earth, dry dung, etc., are collected into an irregular heap, which frequently amounts to as much as a wheelbarrow would contain. Well, I have to say, Mr. Darwin obviously hasn't met any of these particular Viscatchers, because it seems that all these, what looks like um, the result of clear felling, are all the debris collected by these Viscatcher. There are several skips worth here, not just a wheelbarrow, I'd say. The stick-collecting Viscatchers have a lot in common with our pink fairy armadillo. They too have lives that are totally in tune with the desert. They spend their days underground and only come out at night when it's much cooler. Although they don't have armour, they seem far from defenceless. All these sticks seem to make them impossible to sneak up on. <laughs> they destroy the basic concept of good field craft, which is approach your subject stealthily without making any sound. And you can't get anywhere near the sketches without tripping over. And their peculiar collection. <laughs> <laughs> My point exactly. It is impossible to walk around their burrows. Oh, I'm really, really happy with that. I love being surprised, and that was a surprise. I think it's the only real mammal we've seen today. Still haven't seen an armadillo. Dawn, and we've got to be on the right trail, because look, they're signposted. Pichi Ciego, the local name for Pink Fairy Armadillo. This really is Armadillo Country. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, oh, where's Mariella? We've left Mariella back at camp with the breakfast and we didn't expect to be seeing one of these little fellas. So early on, oh, look at that. Not a pink fairy armadillo, but the commoner dwarf armadillo, known here as a peachy. Uh, what a cracker, my first armadillo. I just, I'm still getting used to it. It is the most peculiar creature. There are no animals on earth quite as bizarre as these guys. 
you kind of think, well, this must be as small as they get. Well, this is where we get good because our pink fairy armadillo is, of course, even smaller. I can't quite believe we, <laughs> we've got an armadillo, a little peachy. Look at the scaling on the head. It's just the most peculiar little thing. The word armadillo literally means little armoured thing. And it is undoubtedly armour plated, not quite as robust as the extinct glyptodont, but its armour deflects attack from its usual predators such as dogs and pumas, buying it enough time to run for cover. And when you see um, the little peachy, which is what this guy is called up close, it does also um, bring to mind that giant glyptodont specimen in the Natural History Museum. You look at this guy and you can begin to imagine what a bizarre creature the glyptodont must have been. What a spectacular animal it would have been. Now, Darwin had, had experience of the pitchy, um, gastronomic ones as it happens. And he writes in his diary, although a most excellent dish, when roasted in its shell, it did not make a very substantial breakfast and dinner for two hungry men. He was tucking in to a little peachy, contemplating, pondering the shell. I wonder if this little peachy here was derived from the same stock as a glyptodon. Seems all very logical now, but of course, in Darwin's time, it was one of the most controversial statements he could have made. OK, so it's only fair we release this little lady down our hole. OK, off we go. Dwarf and pink fairy armadillos live in similar terrain, so now we've tracked this one down, we're definitely getting closer to the pink fairies. As we travel through this incredible landscape watching for pink fairy armadillos, we too are being watched. Try an old trick used by hunters. It's also used by foxes to get close to rabbits, and it does work with rabbits in the UK to an extent. Which is, if you start behaving in a totally atypical manner, these animals simply can't resist coming to have a little look. So, there's one way. It looks totally bonkers. You can probably see them better than I can, but sometimes you just get their attention and they just can't resist to have a little sticky beak. Let's see what's going on. Definitely look more curious than they did a couple of minutes ago when they were heading the opposite direction. All right, I admit they're not armadillos, but they are as South American as an armadillo. These are guanaco. And uh, you're probably sitting there going, he's talking nonsense. They're quite clearly llamas. Well, yes. They are llamas of sorts. In fact, the llama is, is a domesticated guanaco in the same way as a dog is a domesticated wolf. They live in family groups known as quadrillas, and that's exactly what we've got here. Females, a youngster, and a male as well. Now, each quadrilla is led by a single stallion who acts as lookout and gives a loud piercing neigh to warn off danger and guards the rear of the group if they have to scatter. This is just what well, I was hoping to see as a little aside to this part of the world, because this really is the flavour of uh, Argentina. I'm amazed they've let us get this close to them, especially with youngsters as well. Only wish the armadillos would do the same. Oh, 
You got it. <laughs> sure. All right, good gloss. Thanks. It's another peachy or dwarf armadillo, Mariella's main speciality. Definitely made me, a male. It's made right? my eyes water. <laughs> good grief. Now, why? Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, has a, has a, <laughs> has a male peachy got such a large penis? <laughs> well, um, imagine they're mounting I'm trying to. the female. <laughs> and uh, the carapace is a big hindrance and you have the whole tail so they need to get around all this wow so not only is it long it must be pretty mobile as well yes all right so once you've uh, gone through the drama of, uh, of actually catching a peach well, what do you do as part of your work with these animals um basically i collect as much information as possible from these animals because we don't know a lot and uh, so i try to collect the data on the natural history We'll start measuring it, so I'll need you to okay. take care of it. You just hold it here on the sides. Okay, yeah. Just press it a little bit so that it won't move. Okay, okay. yeah, I got it. Good. So we'll start with the head because I've seen that peaches from different parts of Mendoza uh, have different head shapes, so maybe they're even different subspecies. Oh, really? Okay. So we're measuring so, his hat. Right. That's hat about 7.2 centimeters. 7.2 centimeters. And then this one is. 5.2. 5.2. So in other parts of the province, they have a broader head. Oh, it's so undignifying, isn't it? <laughs> so I guess with these the peaches, I mean, your work is you know basic understanding of one animal, and yet these are still relatively large and re relatively well known and still fairly common compared relatively. with the animal that's ultimately brought here me here, which is the pink fairy armadillo. I mean, we must know next to nothing about those guys. Um, no. Actually, there's quite a cool digging demonstration. Going straight down with the front legs and then Pushes. pushing the soil out by the back legs. Immediately, I'm holding onto its tail. And if I let go now, what would happen? It'd be carry on going straight down? Uh, yes, and we'll not be able to get it out of the burrow again. Yeah. <laughs> now, oh, how oh, do you get oh, it out? Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was smart, Nick. Yep. In fact, there is a technique to get them out. OK, you've got it now. It's all yours. No, I will not stick my finger into there. So we found armadillos, fantastic little peaches, but our target, the pink fairy armadillo, has so far eluded us. Tomorrow, however, all that should change, because tomorrow we're meeting up with a farmer who has responded to our wanted poster. Now, uh, you tell me where in the world you get a vista like this. It is incredible, this place. It is vast, it is huge, it is super sexy as far as landscapes go. Now, uh, this volcano here is El Nevado, and at the base of it is uh, where we're going to find our Pichi Ciego, which is the pink fairy armadillo. That is where we're heading to meet Senor Rojas, who may well have some valuable information. Senor Rojas and his family are real Argentine gauchos, or cowboys, who have been ranching this desert in pink fairy armadillo country for the last 200 years. So, um, where does he see them and, and how often? No, principalmente salen de noche. He says they, they come out mainly at night. Okay. Pero en el día por ahí se encuentran siempre, alguna vez, de vez en cuando, no, no siempre, siempre. So that sometimes you also sí. see them uh, during the day and uh, they also see tracks. So, oh, so uh, what, what do the tracks look like? I mean, how, how como, we... como el rastro. In the middle, you would have uh, like a line. The, the track, uh, like a line. Yeah, that's the tail or the belly. Exactly, and then you have uh, the it's footprints. Like, like that? Just mm -hmm. like that? So just say we came across one, is it, is it going to be like our peachy? Is it going to be a, a bundle and a scramble and a run, do you think? Pregunta cómo se agarra un peachy ciego. Si usted ve un peachy ciego, cómo lo agarra? No, sí, es un bichito que no hace nada. Es un bichito que usted va y lo pesca y lo tiene ahí y no hace nada. Just pick it up. Pick it up. We're getting closer. Thank you very much. Um, Mariela, thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much
a place where our nocturnal pink fairy armadillo, one of the rarest, most secretive creatures on the planet, definitely, without doubt, lives. Now, we've just got to catch one. Now, this is the fun stuff. We just thought about, now, how do we spot these animals if they're up and moving about in the dune? And if they're nocturnal, we need a few tricks up our sleeves. So this one is rather cool. This is a thermal imaging camera. And what this allows us to do is that when the, it's cooled off a little bit at night, any mammal, any warm-blooded animal walking about on the surface of the dune, its body temperature will show up as a kind of a glow on here, which means that uh, we can then move forward and investigate. I'm getting quite excited by this one. This here is um, a fairly basic uh, image intensifier scope. This allows me to basically see in the dark. In here, there's various infrared lights, and I suspect it doesn't look like anything right now. Lots of wires and buttons and switches. When it's put together, you'll see what I mean. But that is a camera trap. So if there's anything moving around on the dune, hopefully we'll, it'll set off the camera uh, automatically and record itself. Saves us charging after it with the camera crew. However, all my faith, best of my hopes, all go into this. It is what it is. It's the most basic bit of kit. It doesn't have any buttons, knobs, wires or sensors. It's just a bucket and, uh, and a lid. That there is a pitfall trap. The idea is we're going to bury these in the sand. Any creature coming along on the surface of the sand will slip in and be trapped in the bucket. So what I've got to do now is, before it gets dark, get the pitfall traps in place. Lovingly crafted pitfall trap. Only another 20 traps to go. But as I dig them, I'm hitting a snag. Ow! Oh, ow! <laughs> These nasty, nasty plants. Everything out here is out to get you. It all looks the same when you're in it, but. I don't know, can't see the lay of the land, so I've got no idea whether there's a nice little hump or a bump or somewhere where, which could act as a, a natural concentration for these animals. For a better view, I need to get above it all, just like an armadillo predator, the crowned eagle. Now, copying predators is always a great way of hunting, as, after all, they've been doing it a lot longer yes. than anything. That's good. OK, let's go. Let's go. And the crowned eagle is some predator. Armadillos make up over 50% of its diet. Showing this bit of kit isn't quite as effective. I don't think you're supposed to hear that. Oh, that was rude. <laughs> Great. It's, I'm walking. Our driver I'm is praying. Moment. OK, that's all right, no rush. Eagles soar over this landscape and they use their fantastic eyesight to spot peaches out in the open. Of course, I haven't got an eagle's eye. Far from it. Mine are less than 20% as effective. But I had hoped coming up here would give me a better view of the landscape and let me spot a hollow, a dried up watercourse or any kind of feature where the pink fairy armadillos may be found. But there simply weren't any. Instead, being up here just puts into perspective the problem I've got. Ever seen? Maybe except for the Congo forest in Africa. 
here. There's a road, and that's it. But somehow I've got to find an animal this big in this lot. I'm now heading back down to Earth. I'll be honest with you, I'm a little more comfortable down there. Okay, here we go. The terrain is big, with no obvious place where we might find our pink fairy armadillos. So, to shorten the odds of trapping one, I need more information from the Rojas family. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Nick. Y un para este lado por ahí siempre se ve el street de vez en cuando, pero muy raro ver el street. Uh, he says that they seem to come out once a year because they don't see them very often. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's not a good sign. <laughs> once a year, okay. They emerge and walk about five meters and then they dig in again and are okay. underground and emerge again for maybe five meters. Oh, no. <laughs> if the pink fairy armadillo lives under the sand surfacing randomly, it could be a sand swimmer, meaning it has no fixed abode. Quite a few other animals swim in sand. A um, couple here. This one here is the golden mole. This comes from South Africa and, and swims through sand in that area. And also this rather interesting marsupial mole from Western Australia, again from another sandy area. So what they actually do is when they're in the sand, they agitate the sand so the sand becomes like a, a liquid. And then they can literally swim through it. Something very similar about these two animals, they're both very torpedo shaped and they both have their front legs, huge claws for moving through the sand. They also have, um, both of them, uh, a defense at the front here to protect the sensitive part of the animal um, from the abrasion of the sand. Let's get back to our pink fairy armadillo. And crikey, it looks really very, very similar. So overall, pretty good idea that it could possibly be a sand swimmer. But how to find it? Uh, they often come out uh, after rainfall. Okay. But after oh, right. heavy rains, you, you often see them outside. Yeah, I wonder if there's any way of generating our own rain in one of the driest countries on Earth. <laughs> um, hmm, okay. We'll have to make it rain. Pink fairy armadillos are more active after the rain. Now, it hasn't rained here for months, and it won't rain here for months. So, for tonight and tonight only, we are going to become rain gods. Thanks to the local fire brigade. Oh. Oh. We made it rain in the desert. <laughs> and it's not just the armadillo that's enjoying it either. We've got no idea if this is going to work, but it's a wonderful opportunity to try it. I mean, the logic is there. Um, no, I don't think anyone's tried it before, so let's give it a go. They got to bear in mind, this part of the world gets less than 200 millimetres of water in the way of rainfall every year. And uh, what we've just given this area is the best part of 10,000 litres a minute. So uh, you can see, hopefully, um, the odds are in our favour for at least this patch alone. Quite why pink fairy armadillos are seen on the surface after rain is like just about everything else associated with this creature, something of a mystery. But it's thought they're either surfacing to avoid drowning or because there's suddenly a lot more of their insect and worm prey on the surface after rain. Either way, it's my best hope of seeing one. This is looking really good. We've given this whole dune area a real soaking. It's the perfect time of the day, obviously. It's the evening, things naturally start cooling off, and uh, 
hopefully we've hit it bang on for activity of all the animals here, and hopefully this will bring some of them to the surface. Now all we've got to do is wait. Oh, and toast the fire brigade. Oh, hey, hey, hey. salut, salut. It's a uh, salut. <laughs> okay, it's uh, much later now. Um, the dampened dunes are in front of us, and we're now going to investigate it using our various. Uh, gadgets and toys, just see if there's any animal activity. What is uh, quite exciting, or what has changed since earlier on, is almost in competition with our very own rain shower, the gods themselves have uh, decided to put on their own light show. There's every possibility of rain. What's important for us is that the temperature's dropped quite a lot, which um, well, is usually quite good for animal activity, especially in, uh, in hot and arid places like this. So, fingers crossed, and uh, let's have a look, see what we can see. Quick scan with the image intensifier first. All I'm seeing is a green version of, uh, of the location. OK, nothing obvious as yet. We just got to keep uh, keep trying. If anything happens, anything uh, surfaces, then uh, hopefully we'll uh, be in the right place at the right time. Now, um, quite a good little way of uh, I find killing time between nocturnal activities and pursuits is uh, to employ the uh, ultraviolet torch. This really is quite cool. Oh, there we are, look. <laughs> look at that. Even Mark can focus on that fella. That's big. What's really cool is, right, just, just, just check this out, right? That is the colour of it in reality. It's brown and sand coloured. That's why it's so camouflaged, that's what it's designed to do. But of course, for some weird reason, and no one really knows why, apply the UV light and the thing fluoresces and turns what is an otherwise sombre and fairly dull animal into what looks almost like it's made of plastic. <laughs> I love doing this. One thing you haven't uh, necessarily picked up on is since the sun went down and this moment, um, I've become the victim of Argent ooh, Argentinian hospitality. A spontaneous asado, which is an Argentinian barbecue, kind of erupted in the farm. So uh, I hate to admit it, but I'm a slightly intoxicated, which uh, makes playing around with venomous animals just that little bit spicier. However, what a way to go. <laughs> of course, the more time I play around with scorpions, the less time... Ooh, not up my shirt, sleep! ...is the less time, or less chance I've got of actually finding, well, our armadillo. Now I'm going to get out this bit of kit. A thermal imaging camera, a device that detects objects that are hotter or colder than the surrounding terrain. That there is our cameraman. Give us a wave. There we are. See, there is his wave. We'll have a little look around and just see if there's anything with an ambient body or temperature, body temperature that's higher than ambient. Now, while the device can easily spot a six foot cameraman, a four inch pink fairy armadillo is going to prove something of a task. And at the moment, it's struggling to find anything at all. Oh, well. 
we still got our backup plans. We still got what I think is probably going to be the most successful device at the moment, which are the buckets, our pitfall traps. Oh, and we've got our camera trap as well. I thought about that. Just, just, just can't quite allow myself to go to sleep knowing that pink fairy armadillos live here. When you're hunting elusive sand swimming weird creatures, tomorrow is always another day. Well, I have got a little bit of a hangover this morning, I have to say, but the question is, do we have a pink fairy armadillo? This is our camera track that we set up last night. Uh, we've got our infrared light there, we've got the recorder here, um, we've got our sensor up there, and uh, Turn it on. Sadly, just a mouse. So, to our pitfall traps. After all, if anything's going to get us a pink fairy armadillo, it's got to be these. Nothing in there. Nothing in there. little things in here. Mark, you're going to like this. This is one for the cameraman. A tarantula. These animals, like our fairy armadillo, spend most of the time hidden from sight, deep in their burrows. Trap number four. Dung beetle. Lots of special adaptations to digging through the soil. Five. Six. It's a kind of wolf spider. He's not hanging around. Oh, comes through my legs. Straight to you. Ooh. You got it. I ate spider. Trap number eight. Looks like it might be a little venomous fella. Oh, look, it's running straight for the cameraman again. <laughs> Trap 10. Like a little fence lizard of some kind. Oh, see that one? I don't mind. It's just the spiders, I don't know. Like right, right, then. <laughs> Jesus! Full <laughs> bugger. <laughs> I trusted you. You know I don't like spiders. No, I'm going. So, no pink fairy armadillos in the first 10 traps, and no cameraman. Now, I've wanted to see a pink fairy armadillo all my life. Now, my only hope lies in our last few plastic buckets. It's like playing lucky dip for the best prize in the world. Oh, dear, smells bad. Now, I am getting concerned. On to number 17. Well, we've got uh, a rodent, so we know they work on mammals on the surface. It is, unfortunately, a pink fairy armadillo, about the same size, but clearly a phenomenal burrowing little creature, like pretty much everything in the desert, I guess. There we are. Look at that. That's our first proper mammal. Ow. <laughs> Not a pink fairy armadillo, anyway. It'll be in the last three. Number 18, 19. I think we're pretty much done for this one. I can see loads of ants, but I'm not picking them out individually. Oh. So this is it, the last one. Number 20. The last one. There we go, here we go. Nice one. There we are, look. Just a bucket of sand. Get that down your builder's merchant. And with that, last pitfall trap and pretty much all the devices goes our, uh, I guess, our last hope on this trip of actually seeing a pink fairy armadillo. But the gauchos insisted this wasn't the end. There was still somewhere I could see a pink fairy armadillo. Their mother had one. 
If only I'd asked. Yes, of course she's got one. She keeps it as a mascot. Oh, oh, whoa. Oh, Mrs. Gracias, look at that. <laughs> That's the silky hair, it is. It is an extremely well preserved. That is amazing. That is. And where, where did he. Nanyo uh... Basada. This is from last year. He says they're so beautiful. Oh, that is just the most peculiar thing I have. I mean, I just, it, it just, yes, we've seen them in the museum, but to hold one in my hand in a house on a ranch in Argentina where they're found, where this animal lived, can you be in love with a stuffed dead animal? Obviously you can. I know it's not a lion or a tiger or an elephant or any of the other animals that uh, we see on TV oh so very often. But don't you really want to know a bit more about them? I mean, it does look totally subterranean, doesn't it, when you really, when you think about it and when you see what these animals have to move through. It is so peculiar. I mean, it, the whole shape of it, even that bizarre bottom where they got this sort of flat plate at the end there. I think that's probably where they must attach the rocket because it's the only explanation when no one sees these things very often. They must come from outer space. And maybe they do. You see, last night I was reading a very important Pink Fairy Armadillo paper written 33 years ago. And it says, in over 200 hours of field time, during the perfect time from dusk to dawn, they didn't see one, not even a track of one. They found more evidence of the extinct glyptodont, and I guess that puts it all in perspective. There's so many animals out there we just don't have a clue about. And this is one of them. This is the one that started it all for me.